uh, uh, we're uh, meeting at a moment of world history that is in many ways unique. Uh, it's a moment that is ominous, uh, but it's also uh, full of hope. The most powerful state in world history has proclaimed uh, loud and clear that it intends to rule the world by force. Uh, that is the dimension in which it reigns supreme. The war in Iraq uh, will teach some lessons about what lies ahead when the empire decides to strike a blow. That's surely one of the main reasons for the war. Uh, the empire has also declared explicitly and precisely that it will tolerate no competitors now or in the future. Uh, its leaders believe that the means of violence in their hands are so extraordinary that they can dismiss with contempt uh, anyone who stands in their way. That doctrine is by no means new, but it has never before been proclaimed uh, with such brazen arrogance, uh, at least not by I should add, uh, at least not by anyone who we would care to remember. I uh, won't jar your memories. Uh, I'm not going to try to answer the question that was posed for this meeting, the question of how to confront the empire. Uh, the reason is that most of you uh, know the answers as well or better than I do from your own work and your own lives. Uh, the way to confront the empire is to create a world, uh, a different world, uh, one that is not based on violence and subjugation, uh, on hate and fear. Uh, that's why we are here. The World Social Forum offers the hope that these are not idle dreams, and this is also for the first time in history. Uh, uh, yesterday, I had the rare privilege of seeing some of the most inspiring work that is being done to achieve these goals. I was able to spend some hours at the international gathering of uh, Via Campesina at a farm community established by the MST, uh, which I think is the most... Uh, which I think is the most important uh, and exciting popular movement in the world and one of, uh, one of the main reasons One of the main reasons why the World Social Forum is in Brazil and not in uh, the United States or uh, England or somewhere else. Uh, with constructive local actions of the kind that the MST has been pioneering for many years and with international organizations like the Via Campesina and the World Social Forum with sympathy and solidarity and mutual aid, there is real hope for a decent future. I've also had some other experiences in the past few months which give an idea of what the world will be like uh, if imperial violence is not limited and dismantled. Uh, last month I was uh, in Turkey including southeastern Turkey, the Kurdish areas. Uh, these are the, this is the scene of some of the worst atrocities of the 1990s. They are still continuing, just as in Bolivia. 
I was just informed this morning by a friend, a visitor from the Kurdish uh, Human Rights Association, that last week the military forces carried out major atrocities uh, at a town just a few kilometers from the city that I visited last month, uh, murdered a dozen people, uh, left the corpses, uh, very mutilated corpses, very visibly in the streets uh, to terrorize everyone else. Happens to be a town that was destroyed by the military in the last few years, but a few people remain and they have to be terrorized. Uh, the uh, uh, this campaign of state terror uh, uh, drove literally millions of people uh, out of the devastated countryside. Uh, tens of thousands were killed. The Kurdish Human Rights Association estimates about 50,000, 3 million expelled, fled. Uh, those who survive uh, are trying, are you can find them. I visited some in uh, condemned buildings in miserable slums in Istanbul or outside the walls of the cities to which they have uh, fled. 80% uh, of the arms for these atrocities came from the United States, uh, increasing as the atrocities escalated through the 1990s. In the single year 1997, the Clinton administration sent more arms to Turkey than in the entire Cold War period combined up to the onset of the state terror campaign. Uh, the uh, uh, Turkey actually became the leading recipient in the world uh, of uh, U.S. arms. Uh, that's excluding Israel and Egypt, which are a separate category. In 1999, uh, Turkey relinquished this position as the leading recipient of U.S. arms and handed it over to Colombia. The reason is that in Turkey, uh, U.S.-backed state terror had succeeded uh, at a horrendous cost. In Colombia, it had not yet succeeded. Uh, Colombia is the leading human rights violator in the hemisphere, has been for the last 10 years. It has also been the leading recipient of U.S. arms uh, in the hemisphere, actually more than the rest of, the, of Latin America combined, and it now leads the world. It leads the world by other measures, too. For example, it leads the world in uh, murder of labor activists. And more than half of the labor activists killed in the world in the last decade have been killed in Colombia. Uh, last year, close to a half a million people were driven off the land. That's a new record. Uh, the number of displaced people driven off the land in Colombia is now more than two and a half million. Uh, last year, uh, 20 people were killed every day in political violence. That's double the number of five years ago. Uh, the, uh, I was also uh, uh, there uh, a few months ago. Uh, in, uh, uh, I visited uh, Cauca in southern Colombia. That's the province that has the worst human rights record in Colombia, which is quite an achievement. Uh, there I spent hours uh, listening to testimonies by peasants who were driven off the land by chemical warfare, what's called fumigation. Uh, their lives and lands are destroyed, their children are dying, they're sick and wounded, the effects of chemical war. Uh, peasant agriculture, as you all know, is based on a very rich tradition of knowledge and experience gained over hundreds of years, often millennia, um, usually handed down 
by mothers to daughters. Uh, it's a rich, successful, one of the great human achievements, but it's extremely fragile. It can be destroyed in a single generation, which is what is happening consciously. Uh, also being destroyed is some of the richest biodiversity in the world, very much like nearby regions of Brazil. The Campesinos, the indigenous people, uh, Afro-Colombians, uh, can join the millions of people who are somehow surviving in rotting urban slums and camps with the people driven out. Multinational corporations can come in, uh, strip the mountains for coal, extract the uh, oil and other resources, uh, convert what is left of the land to agro-export run by multinationals using laboratory-produced seeds. Uh, the scenes that I personally just happened to see in Kalka and southern Turkey are very different from the celebrations of the Via Campesino gathering uh, at the MST uh, community. But Turkey and Colombia also provide very inspiring uh, and hopeful lessons in different ways because of the indescribable courage and dedication of people who are struggling for justice and freedom, confronting the empire just where it is killing and torturing and destroying. Uh, these are signs of the future if the empire proceeds on its normal course. Remember that this is before it declared the grand strategy of global rule by force. It's not inevitable, and there are some very good models for ending these atrocities, including the MST, the Via Campesina, the World Social Forum. But they have to be developed and built. The range of issues and problems that are coming up at the World Social Forum is very broad, uh, remarkably so. I think we can identify two major themes. Uh, one is global justice and life after capitalism, or to put it more simply, life, because it is not so clear that the species can survive uh, that is literally true. It's not clear that the species can survive very long under existing state capitalist institutions. The, uh, the second theme, the second theme is related. It's the theme of war and peace. More specifically, the war in Iraq that the United States and Britain are desperately trying to carry out virtually alone, in part to teach the lessons that I just mentioned. Well, let me start talking about this with some of the good news about these basic themes. Uh, as you know, there's a conference going on right now of the World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, here in Porto Alegre, uh, the mood is like at the Via Campesina meeting yesterday. Hopeful, vigorous, exciting. Uh, in Davos, so the press tells us, quoting it, the mood has darkened. It is not global party time anymore. <laughs> Uh, in fact, uh, Davos and Puerto Alegre are correlated as the mood and the uh, participation here grows, the mood there darkens and becomes more gloomy, and for good reasons. Uh, 
uh, in fact, the founder of the World Economic Forum has just conceded defeat. Uh, he said, the power of corporations has completely disappeared. So we've won. Now, there's nothing left for us to do but to pick up the pieces, uh, not only talk about a vision of the future that is just and humane, but move on to create life after capitalism. Uh, of course, uh, we know enough to understand that we should not let the praise go to our heads. Uh, there are still a few difficulties ahead. The main theme of the World Economic Forum is building trust, and there's a reason for that. The masters of the universe, as they like to call themselves, know that they are in serious trouble. The World Economic Forum recently released a poll showing that trust in leaders had severely declined. Uh, only leaders of non-governmental organizations, NGOs, only they had the trust of a majority of the population in the world. Uh, they were followed by the United Nations and religious leaders, then going way down, leaders of Western Europe, well below them, corporate executives, and finally at the very bottom, the leaders of the United States, with about 25% trust. 25% uh, uh, trust means essentially zero for a good reason. When people are asked, do you trust leaders, usually they say yes, just out of habit. Uh, so if 25% acted out of habit, that means it's essentially nothing. Uh, it, uh, It actually gets worse. Uh, a few days ago, a poll in Canada found that over a third of the population regard the United States as the greatest threat to world peace. The United States ranks... Uh, the United States ranks more than twice as high as Iraq or North Korea, far high, higher than Al-Qaeda. Uh, a less scientific poll by Time magazine found that over 80% of respondents regarded the United States as the greatest threat to world peace compared with less than 10% for Iraq or North Korea. Uh, without going on, the corporate leaders who paid $30,000 each to attend the somber meetings in Davos have good reasons to take as their theme building trust. The coming war with Iraq is undoubtedly contributing to these interesting and quite important developments. Uh, opposition to the war is completely without historical precedent. In Europe, it is so high that the Secretary of War, Donald Rumsfeld, a few days ago, dismissed Germany and France as just the old Europe, uh, plainly of no concern because of their disobedience. The new Europe, he said, is uh, symbolized by Italy's Berlusconi, who is praying. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's uh, praying that he will be invited to be the third of the three Bs, uh, Bush, Blair, Berlusconi, has kind of a nice ring. Uh, uh, Italy is on board, the White House tells us. It's apparently not a problem that over 80% of the public is opposed to the war, according to the latest polls, uh, that just shows that Italy, too, Italians, belong to the old Europe, 
and they can be sent to the ash can of history, along with France and Germany, and others who do not know their place. These pronouncements and the silence with which they are greeted uh, are very illuminating. They demonstrate the contempt for democracy that is rather typical, historically, among those who feel that they rule the world by right. And there are many other illustrations. When German Chancellor uh, Gerhard Schroeder uh, dared to take the position of the overwhelming majority of voters in the last election, that was described as a shocking failure of leadership, a serious problem that Germany must overcome if it wants to be accepted in the civilized world. The problem lies with Germany, not with the Anglo-American democracies. The problem with Germany, we read in the New York Times, is that the government lives in fear of the voters, and that is causing it to make mistake after mistake. Uh, that's a quote from the spokesperson for the right-wing Christian Social Union Party who understands the real nature of democracy. Uh, the, case of, the case of Turkey is even more revealing. As throughout the region, Turks are very strongly opposed to the war, about 90%, according to the most recent polls. And so far, the government has irresponsibly paid some attention to the people who elected it. It has not bowed completely to the intense pressure and threats that Washington is exerting. The reluctance of the government to follow orders from on high proves that its leaders are not true Democrats. Uh, for those of you who may be too dull to comprehend these subtleties, uh, they were explained by the former ambassador to Turkey, Morten Abramowitz, who's now a distinguished senior statesman and commentator. Uh, he explained that 10 years ago, Turkey was governed by a real Democrat who, I'm quoting him, overrode his countrymen's pr profound preference to stay out of the Gulf War. But democracy has declined in Turkey. The current leadership is following the people, revealing its lack of democratic credentials. And regrettably, he says, for the United States, there is no true Democrat around, as there was 10 years ago. So it will be necessary to bring true, true democracy to Turkey by economic strangulation and other coercive means, regrettably, but that is demanded by what the elite press calls our yearning for democracy. Brazil is witnessing another exercise of the real attitudes towards democracy among the masters of the universe. In the most free election in the hemisphere, a large majority voted for policies that are strongly opposed by international finance and investors, by the IMF and the U.S. Treasury Department. In earlier years, that would have been the signal for a military coup, installing a murderous national security state, as in Brazil 40 years ago. Now that can't be done, in part because populations north and south will simply not tolerate it, but also because there are now simpler ways to undermine the will of the people. Uh, they're known as neoliberalism. The neoliberal instruments that have been put into place uh, include economic controls, uh, capital flight, attacks on the currency, and privatization, and other means which are designed to reduce the arena of popular choice. And these, it is hoped, may compel the government to follow the dictates of what international economists call the virtual parliament of investors and lenders who make the real decisions 
uh, coercing the population who are an irrelevant nuisance according to the reigning principles of what is called democracy. When I was about to leave for the airport to come here, I received another of the constant flood of inquiries from the press about why there is so little anti-war protest in the United States. Now, these inquiries are very revealing. They demonstrate how little protest there ever has been among elites, how little sense they have of what is happening in their own country in the past 40 years and what is happening now. In fact, protest in the United States, as elsewhere, is at levels that have no historical precedent, and they are all over the country. There has, uh, just to take one example, uh, last week the city council in Chicago passed an anti-war resolution, 46 to 1, joining many other cities and towns. The same is true in other sectors, including those that are the most highly trusted, as the World Economic Forum learned to its dismay, uh, NGOs and religious organizations and figures, with few exceptions. Several months ago, the biggest university in the country passed a strong anti-war resolution. That's the University of Texas, uh, right next door, right next door to uh, George W.'s ranch, uh, and it's easy to continue. So why the widespread judgment among elites that the tradition of dissent and protest has died? Invariably, comparisons are drawn to Vietnam, which is a very revealing fact. We have just passed the 40th anniversary of the public announcement that the Kennedy administration was sending the U.S. Air Force to bomb South Vietnam, also initiating plans to drive millions of people into concentration camps, along with chemical warfare programs to destroy crops. There was no pretext of defense, except in the sense of official rhetoric. Defense against the internal aggression of the South Vietnamese in South Vietnam and their assault from the inside. That's President Kennedy and his United Nations ambassador. Protest was non-existent. It did not reach any meaningful level for several years. Uh, by that time, hundreds of thousands of U.S. troops had joined the occupying army. Uh, densely populated areas were being demolished by saturation bombing, and the aggression had spread to the rest of Indochina. Today, in dramatic contrast to the 1960s or ever, there is large-scale, committed, and principled popular protest all over the United States before the war has been officially launched. That, uh, that has never happened. Uh, it reflects a steady increase over these years in the unwillingness of the population to tolerate aggression and atrocities. One of many such changes which are in fact worldwide. They are part of the background for what is taking place in Porto Alegre and part of the reason for the gloom in Davos. The political leadership is well aware of these developments. When a new uh, administration comes into office, it receives a review of the world situation uh, by the intelligence agencies. That's in secret. Now, we learn about these things many years later, if at all. But when Bush number one came into office in 1989, a small part of it was leaked. It was a passage concerned with conflicts 
with what they called much weaker enemies. That's the only kind anyone would ever think of fighting, of course. Uh, intelligence analysts advised that in conflicts with much weaker enemies, the United States must win decisively and rapidly or popular support will collapse. It's not like the 1960s when the population could tolerate a murderous and destructive war uh, for many years without visible protest. That's gone. The activist movements of the past 40 years have had a significant civilizing effect. By now, the only way to attack a much weaker enemy is to construct a huge propaganda offensive uh, depicting it as about to commit genocide or maybe a threat to our very survival and then to celebrate a miraculous victory over the awesome foe while chanting praises for the courageous leaders who came to the rescue just in time. Now that's the current scenario in Iraq. Uh, Polls seem to reveal more support for the planned war in the United States than elsewhere, but those numbers are very misleading. It's important to bear in mind that the United States is the only country outside Iraq where Saddam Hussein is not only reviled, but also feared. There's a flood of lurid propaganda warning that if we don't stop him today, he's going to destroy us tomorrow. Uh, the next evidence of his weapons of mass destruction will be a mushroom cloud. That's what the National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice announced in September. Uh, presumably that means a nuclear bomb in New York. Uh, no one in Iraq's neighborhood seems concerned, uh, perhaps because they know that as a result of the sanctions, the vast majority of the country's population has been kept on a semi-starvation diet for years, as the World Health Organization reported, and that Iraq's economy and military expenditures are a fraction of Kuwait's, which has 10% of Iraq's population, and much farther below uh, other states in the region. But the United States is different. When Congress granted the president authority to go to war last October, it was, in their words, to defend the national security of the United States against the continued threat posed by Iraq. Uh, we must tremble in fear before this awesome threat while the countries nearby seek to integrate Iraq back into the region including those that were attacked by Saddam Hussein when he was a friend and ally of those who now run the show in Washington, who were happily providing him with aid, including the means to develop weapons of mass destruction at a time when he was far more dangerous than today. A serious measure of support for war in the United States would have to extricate this fear factor, which is genuine and is unique to the United States. The residue would give a more realistic picture of uh, support for the resort to violence and would show, I think, that it's about the same as elsewhere, overwhelming, overwhelming opposition. It's rather striking that strong opposition to the coming war extends right through the establishment. So the current issues of the two major foreign policy journals feature articles opposing the war by leading figures of foreign policy elites. The very respectable American Academy of Arts and Sciences released a long monograph on the war, trying to give the most sympathetic possible account of the Bush administration position and then dismantling it point by point. One respected analyst, they quote, 
is a senior associate of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, who warns that the United States is becoming a menace to itself and to mankind under its current leadership. There are no precedents for anything like this, and they show very clearly how isolated the leadership of the United States and Britain are in the world, even in their own countries. We should recognize that these criticisms from the establishment are very narrow. They are concerned with threats to the United States. They do not take into account the likely effect of a war on Iraqis. The warnings of the United Nations and aid agencies that millions of people will be at very serious risk that in a country that is at the edge of survival after a terrible war that targeted its basic infrastructure, which amounts to biological warfare, and a decade of devastating sanctions that have killed hundreds of thousands of people and blocked any reconstruction while strengthening the brutal tyrant who rules Iraq. Nevertheless, the threats that do concern the establishment critics are very real. They were not surprised when the CIA informed Congress last October that they know of no link between Iraq and Al-Qaeda-style terrorism, but that an attack on Iraq uh, would create such links. Uh, it uh, would probably increase the terrorist threat to the West in many ways. Uh, they pointed out that it is likely to uh, create, to inspire a new generation of terrorists bent on revenge and it might induce Iraq to carry out terrorist attacks that are already in place. That's a possibility taken very seriously by high-level U.S. analysts. A high-level task force of the Council on Foreign Relations just released a report warning of likely terrorist attacks that will be far worse than September 11th uh, dangers, they say, that become much more urgent by the prospect of the U.S. going to war with Iraq. That includes the possible use of weapons of mass destruction right within the United States. And they provide many illustrations. Actually, if you read it, it's virtually a cookbook for terrorists. And it's not the first. Uh, similar ones were published by prominent strategic analysts long before September 11th. It's also understood that an attack on Iraq may lead not just to more terror, but also to proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, which means a serious threat to human survival, and for a very simple reason. Potential targets of the United States understand that there is no other way to deter the most powerful state in history, a state which is pursuing America's imperial ambition. Happens to be a title of an article in the main establishment journal, Foreign Affairs, warning of the dangers to the United States and to the world of the grand strategy that was proclaimed by the Bush administration last September ruling the world by force. Uh, prominent hawks now warn that an a war in Iraq might lead to the greatest proliferation disaster in history. They know that if Iraq has chemical and biological weapons, the dictatorship keeps them under tight control and would not use them except as a last resort if it's attacked and would surely not leak them to the Osama bin Ladens of the world because that would be a terrible threat to Saddam Hussein himself. But under attack, the society would collapse, including the controls over weapons of mass destruction, the hawks I'm quoting tell us. These would be privatized 
and offered to the huge market for unconventional weapons where they will have no trouble finding buyers and that will be a nightmare scenario, the Hawks warn, for all of us. Uh, even before the Bush administration began beating the war drums about Iraq, there were plenty of warnings that its adventurism was going to lead to proliferation of weapons of mass destruction as well as terror simply as a deterrent. In fact, right now, the United States is teaching the world a very ugly and dangerous lesson. If you want to defend yourself from us, you had better mimic North Korea and pose a credible military threat, including weapons of mass destruction. Otherwise, we will demolish you uh, in pursuit of the new grand strategy, which really is remarkable. Not entirely new, but an unusually brazen proclamation that the U.S. will rule the world by force and tolerate no possible competitors or opposition. That has caused plenty of shudders, not only among the usual victims, the great majority of the people of the world, and in old Europe, uh, but right at the heart of the U.S. foreign policy elite who recognize, I'm quoting, that the commitment of the United States to active military confrontation for decisive national advantage will leave the world more dangerous and the U.S. less secure. That's the foreign policy elite in their own journals. The timing of this propaganda campaign is also very instructive. It was so transparent that it also has been a topic of discussion and sometimes ridicule right in the mainstream. The campaign began last September. Before that, Saddam was a terrible guy, but not a threat to the survival of the United States. The mushroom cloud was announced in early September. And since that time, fear of the, uh, that Saddam will attack the United States has been running at about 60 to 70 percent of the population. There's nothing remotely like that anywhere else in the world. Uh, the, uh, this is so obvious that mainstream commentators are ridiculing it. The chief political analyst of United Press International, commenting on this, wrote that September marked the opening of the political campaign for the midterm congressional elections. As he put it, the administration was campaigning to sustain and increase its power on a policy of international interventionism, new radical preemptive military strategies, and a hunger for a politically convenient and perfectly timed confrontation with Iraq. As long as domestic issues were in the forefront, Bush and his cohorts were losing ground, which is very natural because they're carrying out a serious assault against the general population. But he continues, although there were new, no new threats since the beginning of September, National security issues moved into the driver's seat, not just Al-Qaeda, but an awesome and threatening military power, Iraq. Uh, those same observations have been made for many others. That's actually quite convenient for people like us. Uh, we can just quote the mainstream instead of giving controversial analyses. The Carnegie Endowment series senior associate who I quoted before writes that Bush and company are following the classic modern strategy of an endangered right-wing oligarchy, which is to divert mass discontent into nationalism inspired by fear of enemies about to destroy us. And that strategy is of critical importance if the radical nationalists setting policy in Washington hope to announce, to advance their announced plan for unilateral world domination 
through absolute military superiority while conducting a major assault against the interests of the majority of the domestic population. For the election, the strategy worked, barely. The fall 2000 election was won by a small number of votes, but enough to hand Congress to the executive. Now, there have been careful analyses of the election since. They found that voters maintained their opposition to the Bush administration on social and economic issues, but suppressed these concerns in favor of security concerns, which typically lead to support for the figure in authority, uh, the brave cowboy who has to ride to our rescue. As history shows, it is all too easy for unscrupulous leaders to terrify the public with consequences that have not been attractive. That is the natural method to divert attention from the fact that tax cuts for the rich and other devices are undermining the prospects for a decent life for a large majority of the U.S. population and for future generations. When the presidential campaign begins next year, Republican strategists surely do not want people to be asking questions about their pensions or their jobs or health care and other such matters. Rather, they should be praising their heroic leader for rescuing them from imminent destruction by a foe of colossal power and by then marching on to confront the next powerful force bent on our destruction that could be Iran, it could be conflicts in the Andean countries. There are lots of good choices as long as the targets are defenseless. Of course, there is much more to it than domestic considerations, which are of no slight importance in themselves. The September 11th terrorist atrocities provided an opportunity and a pretext to implement long-standing plans to take control of Iraq's immense oil wealth. They are a central component of the Persian Gulf resources that the State Department 60 years ago described as a stupendous source of strategic power and one of the greatest material prizes in world history. U.S. intelligence predicts that these will be of even greater significance in the years ahead. The issue has never been accessed. The same intelligence an uh, analyses uh, anticipate that the United States itself will rely on more secure supplies in the Western Hemisphere and West Africa, which is not good news for the people of the countries there. Uh, the same was true after World War II. What matters is control over the material prize, which funnels enormous wealth to the United States in many ways, Britain as well, and control over the stupendous source of strategic power, which translates into a lever of unilateral world domination, the goal that is now openly proclaimed and is frightening much of the world, including old Europe and the conservative establishment within the United States. I think a realistic look at the world gives a mixed picture. There are many reasons to be encouraged, but there will be a long, hard road ahead.